Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other world. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. Seven things were created prior to the creation of the world. The law, repentance, the throne of glory, the garden of Eden, Gehenna, the site of the temple and the name of the Messiah. And for all these things, proof is to be found within the scriptures. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. We broadcast every Wednesday evening, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on Studio B, and I am streaming from near Athens, Georgia, here East Coast, United States of America. I thank all of you again for taking the time to join me this evening. It's always a pleasure to be able to come to you in this manner to share this platform as truth and also to be able to share in revelation those things which the most high has led me to in discernment and with the hour being so late and in my opinion we are that generation which would see the fulfillment of all things that certainly Things are moving at accelerated pace. And just looking back at, for instance, the blooming of the fig tree, which those of you that are familiar with my work, you know that I equate that to being the recreation of the nation state of Israel and that the that was a sign, a harbinger to... Satan and Legion that their time is almost up. As it says within scripture that woe unto you, O earth and sea, for the devil comes down to you with wrath, knowing that he hath but short time. And we saw even when Christ was here incarnated into flesh form and took on mortal embodiment, that Legion recognized him then as the Son of God and also as their judge and tormentor. And they asked him, have you come to torment us before the time? And so they know that there is a time where all their efforts all their, the agenda for their focus and rebellion will come to an end and that everything they strove for will all be meaningless. And they also know that it will be Christ in second advent that returns for the harvest to separate the goat from the sheep and the wheat from the tares, the elect from the wicked, that it will be that defining moment that not only brings off the rapture or the protection of the church, but also the wrath of God being poured out on those not written into or included or those that were blotted out of the books of life. And so they 
know it much more than humanity because most are still in the dark and lost and wayward and led astray and there are few that are or have any concern for the end of days and for eternity and so those that are the watchmen and the watchwomen on the wall that the children of day that watch for the signs and that know that summer is nigh sounding the alarm blowing the trumpet and warning those that would hear those that would listen of those things that are coming they are largely considered insane by the majority opinion and there is very few that can seemingly get it when message is shared and so for me it's a tremendous blessing to come together in fellowship with those of you that I know to be students of the word seekers of truth and that have dedicated yourselves in manner where you consider the things of the kingdom to be relevant and important and the reason largely for your being here in this time and in this place and that kind of remembrance that kind of knowledge is very rare in this day and age where so many people are caught up in delusion and swept away and being led to believe that the fallen ones are our gods and our creators and that they are coming to save us from ourselves that they are the ancient aliens or the extraterrestrials which so many now believe created us in ancient times and then just left and abandoned this world to its own device um you know they say that christians believe in fairy tales that's kind of funny but anyways and so i know also that when i speak about these kind of things that many are apprehensive to even listen to hear what i say and then the majority are convicting and that not only make fun of the message but also criticize and condemn those of us that are warning on strong delusion because the bible tells us that even the very elect could be deceived if it were possible and that because this generation has no love of the truth that god would send them strong delusion and in my opinion the recently over the last few years especially since 2015 there has been a strong movement towards introspection on the cosmology and where we consider and believe ourselves to be with regard to living on a planet which is in movement around a sun which is one of many stars that happens to have randomly evolved life because of you know the so-called goldilocks zone and that everybody believes that all the stars in the sky are all galaxies and suns with individual planetary systems around them and that the universe is infinite and that we're nothing special 
that everything is just um, part of a, a grander whole, even though that is true, but yet we truly, when you come to understand the truth of where we are and what's going on, we are the focus of the Most High's attention and that everything was created for us being that we are the creature that was made in the image of the Most High God, male and female, created he them. And so this evening I want to talk about a little bit about the establishment of the creation as well as who established and who created and who brought forth uh, the heavens and the earth as stated by scripture because there is a movement now to teach and to guide those that are seeking into an answer that declares that Satan and the fallen angels or the extraterrestrials, the Nephilim, the Anunnaki, whatever you want to call them, that they somehow created this world. And it's interesting to me because, you know, I spent 20 years studying New Age philosophy and examining uh, Sumerian mythology. Also, I need to say for those that are listening in, in the chat room, that uh, my computer, about a week and a half ago, um, something happened, and I'm now having to utilize a whole new setup. And so a lot of things are not uh, fixed. And so trying to get into the chat room this evening, something was not right. It kept giving me a script where it wouldn't let me type. And it also, you know, basically cast me out of the chat room. And so for that reason, I'm not able to be there um, and to be able to, you know, field your questions, your inquiries. And so I would recommend that people go to our Discord group, which is Sacred Word Publishing. Uh, you can search for it on Discord and join the conversation there and I will be at some point logging in there. I just have not had chance to do that yet, but uh, I did want to specifically address this whole concept that's being taught by a lot of people that, you know, Satan created humanity and also um, the, the earth and the heavens as we have come to, experience and know it whether that's you know the matrix of uh, the matrix which is parading as reality and the system that we live in whether materialistic or physical this third dimensional reality that in my opinion satan does not have that kind of power that kind of authority and he cannot imbue life and that one of the things that in the scriptures it speaks about at the end of days that one of the signs that the antichrist is not the christ is that he will not be able to resurrect the dead or to give life or to create from nothing he does not have the power to manifest from nothingness, only God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have the power of instant manifestation and from nothingness to form something of nothing and to give life to something that is inanimate. And to think otherwise is really to believe that Satan is God when he is not. And that's one of the reasons why 
he wanted to exalt himself above the stars and the clouds of God and to divert worship and to trick everybody into believing that he has the powers of the Most High and that he is God when he is not. But as I said, there is a a movement to where people believe and, you know, very wise and intelligent people that I have great respect for, um, they are accepting this line of thought and also teaching it. And so this evening I'm going to review some passages and also show scripturally how without a doubt, which it's strange for me to even have to go here, but, you know, to affirm that the creation was established by God, that seems like common sense, and yet it's not. And that for whatever reason, in this day and age, so many have accepted opinion that is contrary to what seems, you know, common common sense. I mean, even if you're not familiar with Scripture and the Genesis timeline, um, it would it would seem to me that you would know that God created all things and is the source for all things. And this also includes the Holy Spirit being the feminine aspect of the Godhead and how female and the duplicity that we see in the creation that it is a reflection of source and that we see in Romans actually let me pull it up that within in the scripture in Romans it tells us that the creation reflects the Godhead. In Romans chapter 1 verse 20 it says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. And then if you continue reading on, you see that Paul makes reference to uh, how they took and changed uh, understanding of the Godhead from being one of male and female to that being only homosexual or being only male which to me, you know, kind of shows um, how perverted things would get in this day and age to where people would remove the female from being an aspect of the Godhead. When the creation, as it says, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made and that the creation reflects the duplicity of male and female. That is the duality that exists in the creation and everything is born of woman. If you exclude woman from from being an aspect of the creation, how did the creation perpetuate itself? Because everything is born of woman. And without that as a, you know, principal factor of how the creation perpetuates itself, I mean, two men can bring forth a child and cannot propagate 
either energetically or as we see in the material world that it takes a couple to produce a child and that Christ himself is said to be the only begotten. And so in my opinion, we see that the Godhead reflects what is the nucleus of the human family, that we have the the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Mother, and then Christ as the Holy Child, the Logos, the Son, the Only Begotten. And so anyways, we'll, we'll talk about these things uh, going into some of this information, but I'll read this as well, Colossians. For by him, Christ, wisdom, wisdom which is the Holy Spirit, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And looking at, especially Proverbs, we see that it is by wisdom, which is the Holy Spirit, that there are three that bear witness in the heavens, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And that Wisdom pre-existed with the Father and the Son, and it was they that brought forth all things in the world. It says, Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, In the openings of the gates in the city, she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. And there's a whole bunch of passages that I can go into, but I'm only going to read a few key ones just just to affirm that, again, wisdom was with the Father and the Son, and that being regarded as a she within Scripture, it confirms that she was the female aspect of the Godhead, of which humanity, the female part of humanity, was made in the image of. In Proverbs chapter 3, it says, Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths, our peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. And happy is everyone that retaineth her. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. And so that's the Father. And we know that the Father and the Son are one. And so the Father and the Son by wisdom, by the Holy Spirit, had founded the earth and by understanding hath established the heaven. And so again, it shows you that the three together. And we see confirmation of this as well in chapter 8. And this will be the last thing that I read with regard to this, and then I'll go into, again, how it is that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit created the heavens and the earth. Not Satan, not Legion, not the angels, but the Holy Trinity. They are the only ones with the power to create and to manifest from nothing. And so... Proverbs chapter 8. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. 
I was set up from everlasting from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. If you read this particular passage in the Targum, it actually speaks about wisdom as being a handmaiden and that she, again, was preexistent with the Father and the Son. All right, and so we're going to look at passages from Isaiah specifically because Isaiah and one of the interesting things that I wanted to bring forth this evening as well in uh, sharing these passages from Isaiah is that I will bring forth quotations from both the King James and also from the Targum, the Aramaic translation and the Chaldean translation to share with you how, especially when it comes to the word of the Lord, that this ideology, this concept of Christ having a relationship with the patriarchs and with Israel as chosen nation and chosen people, how this knowledge has been hidden, but that especially Isaiah the as prophet his oracles his prophecies make clear that Christ was Savior Messiah without a doubt he more than any other Old Testament prophet lays out the story prophetically of the coming of Christ, his crucifixion, his uh, murder, his even his descent into Sheol, his resurrection, his freeing Adam and Israel from the bondage of hell. All those things are brought forth in these particular passages. And so let me log in really quickly to our Discord chat so I can field those questions. And as I said, um, you know, I apologize that I'm unable to get into the freedom slots, freedom slips chat room. All right. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining me this evening. I hope you're enjoying the show. I think it is very important, the kind of things I'm going to speak about and cover in this evening's broadcast. And so I'm going to start reading from the Targum. I'm g- um, from Isaiah, but I want to begin with a passage from Ezra chapter 6, the fourth book of Ezra. Because, And this is one of my most favorite 
uh, chapters, the first six verses of for Ezra or second Esdras. It says this. And he said unto me in the beginning, when the earth was made before the borders of the world stood or ever the winds blew before it thundered and lightened or ever the foundations of paradise were laid before the fair flowers were seen or ever the movable powers were established before the innumerable multitude of angels were gathered together or ever the heights of the air were lifted up before the measures of the firmament were named or ever the chimneys in Sion were hot and ere the present years were sought out and or ever the invention of them that now sin were turned before they were sealed that have gathered faith for a treasure. Then did I consider these things and they all were made through me alone and through none other. By me also they shall be ended, and by none other. And so God is telling you right there, just as, you know, wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8, how she speaks about before the creation, before the foundations of the earth were established, that she was with the Father and the Son, here God tells you that he alone with the Holy Spirit and with the Son, that they were the ones that established the heavens and the earth. Not Satan, not, you know, the fallen angels, not anybody else, but they alone. And it would be them that ends it. They brought it forth. They established the second world age. And they will also bring forth judgment and destroy the current heaven and earth. Because it tells us in Scripture that there will be a new heaven and a new earth at the end of this age. And that this current age, as it says in Second Peter, would be destroyed by fervent heat. That the stars crashing to the earth would set it ablaze to such degree that the earth becomes renewed. And so, let us go into Isaiah. And the other interesting thing about what I'm going to cover in Isaiah, and I, I probably should just read from the Targum version just in case we run out of time. I think I'll, I'll do that. So you can follow along with your King James, but I'll read the Targum version, and then I'll point out a few key differences. But you'll see as you follow along, you know, where those differences lie and how it is clear within the Targum as to when we're speaking about the end of days. Because much of Isaiah is prophetic. I mean, so much of Isaiah is prophetic. And it shows without a doubt that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were the ones that created the heavens and the earth and also established humanity. You know, that it wasn't the... the even though, yes, I do agree that the fallen angels tried to create a slave race of the pre-Adamites that were here, upon the earth, but they did not create them. Even in the Sumerian texts, it speaks about how there was this Bigfoot type of creature that was a, a hominid already present when they were cast out of the heavens and they arrived here. And how they did these genetic 
experimentations and also that they engaged in direct bestiality with these particular creatures in order to uh, in order to attempt to evolve them in such manner that they could become slave slaves unto them that they could serve in menial labor and so yeah absolutely that yeah, i i believe that it was their attempt to enslave the pre-Adamites and to indoctrinate them into abomination, child and blood sacrifice, cannibalism, things of that nature, that God made modern Adam and our current ancestors in his own image and that it would be through this new creature that Christ would incarnate into the world in order to redeem us and to rectify the fall. But that condemnation to the devil and his children would also be wrought and perpetuated. Because when we arrived, you know, they, humanity, modern humanity, became the focus of their attempts to bring us under their authority and to lead astray humanity so that none of the sons of Adam would inherit the ordinances which they abandoned in the heavens. And so we will look at that. All right, I'm going to be reading from chapter 28, verses 5 through 29. Actually, I'm going to start from verse 1 because you know it talks about Satan in this early. It says, Woe that he gave a crown to the proud and foolish prince of Israel, and that he gave a diadem to the wicked of the house of the sanctuary of his praise. They who are at the head of the valley of fatness are smitten with wine. Now these are the fallen angels, the rebel ones, Lucifer. Behold, plagues strong and mighty are coming from the Lord, like a storm of hail, like a whirlwind, like a storm of mighty waters. Overflowing thus the nations shall come upon them and shall lead them into captivity to another land on account of the sins which are in their hands. The crown of the pride of the foolish prince of Israel shall be trodden down with feet and the diadem which he gave to the wicked of the house of the sanctuary of his praise, which is on the head of the valley of fatness, shall be as the first ripe fig before the summer, which when one sees it, no sooner is it in the hand than one devours it. At that time, the Messiah of the Lord of hosts shall be for a crown of rejoicing, and for a crown of praise to the remnant of his people. For a word of true judgment to them that sit in the house of justice, in order that they should judge according to truth, and to give victory to them that are going forth into battle, to bring them back in peace to their homes. But verily, these are drunk with wine. They are swallowed up of old wine. The priest and the scribe are drunk. In old wine they are swallowed up on account of wine. They have erred. They are turned after sweet food. Their judges have erred. 
because all their tables are full of polluted and loathsome food. They have not a spot free from raping. To whom was the law given? And to whom was the command given to understand wisdom? Was it not to the house of Israel, who were beloved above all nations, and beloved above all the kingdoms? Surely they were commanded to do the law, but what they were commanded they were not willing to do. The prophets prophesied unto them that if they would repent, it should be forgiven them. But they did not obey the words of the prophets. They walked after the desire of their own soul. Neither did they desire to do my law. They hoped to have idolatrous worship established among them, and they did not consider the worship of the house of my sanctuary. To worship in the house of my sanctuary was as a little thing in their eyes. My Shekinah was as a little thing in their eyes. Because with feigned speech and with mocking language, this people mocked the prophets who prophesied unto them. The prophets said unto them, This is the house of the sanctuary. Worship ye in it. And this is the possession in which there is rest. But they would not accept instructions. This shall be the cup of their punishment. Because they have transgressed the word of the Lord and because they were commanded to do my law, but would not do what they were commanded, therefore they shall be delivered unto the nations who do not know the law, because they walked after the desire of their soul and had no delight to do my will. Therefore they shall have no help or support because the house of my sanctuary was too little in their eyes to worship there therefore they shall be left as a little thing in the eyes of the nations among whom they shall go in captivity in order that they may walk and stumble backward and be broken and snared and taken therefore hear ye the word of the lord wicked men rulers of this people that are in Jerusalem. Because ye say, we have made a covenant with death and have made peace with the destroyer. Ye say, when the blow of the enemy shall come upon you like an overwhelming river, it shall not come upon us because we have placed our confidence in a lie and have hidden ourselves under falsehood. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I appoint a king in Zion, a king mighty, powerful, and terrible. I will make him powerful, and I will strengthen him, saith the prophet. But the righteous who believe these things shall not be moved when distress shall come. And I will make judgment straight as a line of a building and justice as plummet because you would hide yourselves and my justice shall burn against the confidence of your lie. And because you would hide yourselves from the coming distress, the nation shall lead you in captivity. And your covenant with death shall be destroyed. And your peace with the destroyer shall not stand. When the stroke of the enemy shall come upon you, it shall be like an overwhelming river, and ye shall be unto them for a treading underfoot. At the time of its passing by, it shall lead you captive, Because each morning it shall pass by, by day and by night, and it shall come to pass before the time 
of the curse shall have come, that ye shall consider the words of the prophets. For their strength shall be diminished by reason of mighty slavery, and the government of the oppressors shall increase their subjection. For as the mountains tremble when the glory of the Lord was revealed in the days of King Isaiah, and in the wonders which he performed for Joshua in the valley of Gibeon, taking vengeance on the wicked who had transgressed against his word, so shall he be revealed to take vengeance on them who work works, strange works, and on those who worship with idolatrous worship. But now deal not wickedly, lest your bands be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord, the God of hosts, a consummation and an end upon all the inhabitants of the land. The prophet said, listen to and hear my voice. Turn and hear my word. The prophets prophesied at all times in order to teach. If peradventure the ears of sinners might be open and receive instruction. Is it not so? If the house of Israel would set their faces to do the law and repent, then behold, he would gather them from among the nations amongst whom they were dispersed like fitches and cumin that are scattered. And behold, he would bring their offspring together according to their tribes as seed of wheat in an uncultivated field and barley in the appointed place and spelt in the borders. All these things are instruction of judgment that they may know that our God shows them the right path in which they ought to walk. And, you know, I've just got a couple more passages, but this is relevant for our generation. This is relevant for the people of this time. For they do not tread out the fitches with an iron threshing instrument, nor do they turn the wheels of a cart upon the cumin, but they beat out the fitches with a staff and the cumin with a rod. Corn they tread out, yet they will not continue to tread it out forever. But he will throw it into confusion with the wheel of his wain and would separate the corn and blow away the chaff. This also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts, who in the vast knowledge of his mind hath established the world. He hath multiplied his works in the beginning by his great wisdom. Isaiah chapter 28 from the target. And so we see again here at the very end that God reiterates the Lord of hosts, who in the vast knowledge of his mind hath established the world. He hath multiplied his works in the beginning by his great wisdom. There's a passage from the legends of the Jews that I want to share really quickly before break. It says this, and you'll see how this is relevant to what I just read. In the beginning, 2,000 years before the heaven and the earth, seven things were created. The Torah written with black fire on white fire and lying in the lap of God. The divine throne erected in the heaven, which later was over the heads of the Hayat, which are the cherubim. Paradise on the right side of God, hell on the left side. The celestial sanctuary directly in front of God, having a jewel on its altar graven with the name of the Messiah. And a voice that cries aloud, Return, ye children of men. When God resolved upon the creation of the world, he took counsel with the Torah. Her advice was this. O oh Lord, a king without an army and without courtiers and attendants hardly deserves the name of a king, for none is nigh to express the homage due to him. 
The answer pleased God exceedingly. Thus did he teach all earthly kings by his divine example to undertake not without first consulting advisors. All right, um, I'll pick it up when we return. There's one last portion that I want to share, and it connects again to that passage that I just read about God establishing the heavens and the earth by his wisdom, which is the Holy Spirit. All right, we'll be right back for second hour. All right, welcome back, everybody, for second hour. I do want to uh, finish up what I was speaking about with regard to the counsel that the Father took with the Holy Spirit, uh, referenced here as the Torah, wisdom, and also with the Son, the Logos. And as I stated, this was in connection to Isaiah chapter 28, verse 29, where it says, This also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts, who in the vast knowledge of his mind hath established the world. He hath multiplied his works in the beginning by his great wisdom. And that great wisdom is the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. Um, Wisdom in the Greek is Sophia. And in the Hebrew is Shokma, which even just mentioning that, you know, that wisdom, the Greek translation of wisdom is Sophia. They label you a Gnostic or try to, you know, say that you're teaching uh, Gnostic teachings about the Holy Spirit when all of that has been perverted perverted that and counterfeited that these concepts are originally biblical not gnostic the gnostics borrowed from the traditions that are found in the scriptures with the holy spirit being the feminine aspect of the godhead and this is verified in proverbs and so much of the apocrypha that you know, I'm not even going to go into this evening. I may share some passages at the end, but I want to get through some of this other stuff first. And so going back to the legends of the Jews, it says again, when God resolved upon the creation of the world, he took counsel with the Torah. Her advice was this. O Lord, a king without an army and without courtiers and attendants hardly deserves the name of a king, and for none is nigh to express the homage due to him. The answer pleased God exceedingly. Thus did he teach all earthly kings by his divine example to undertake not without first consulting advisors. And we see that, you know, God even uh, in Psalms 82, he gathers with the counsel of the mighty, Uh, He meets with the sons of God, who are the angels. Um, And and even here in this example, when when the Trinity was talking about and discussing whether to create man, this is what it says. The advice of the Torah was given with some reservations. She was skeptical about the value of an earthly world on account of the sinfulness of men who would be sure to disregard her precepts. But God dispelled her doubts. He told her that repentance had been created long before and sinners would have the opportunity of mending their ways. Besides, the temple service would be invested with anointing power and paradise and hell were intended to do duty as reward and punishment. Finally, the Messiah was appointed to bring salvation, which would put an end to all sinfulness. Now, remember at the beginning of the show, I read that there were seven things were created prior to the creation of the world, the law, repentance, 
the throne of glory, the garden of Eden, Gehenna, the site of the temple, and the name of the Messiah. And for all these things, proof is to be found in the scriptures. That was from the Chronicles of Jeremiah on the beginning of creation. And so, you know, the plan of salvation was established even before the creation of the earth. And even before uh, man was created to then be tempted and fall. And notice again that in advising with the Torah, wisdom, the Holy Spirit, it is referenced, she is referenced as being a her. Continuing, nor is this world inhabited by man the first of things earthly created by God. He made several worlds before ours, but he destroyed them all because he was pleased with none until he created ours. But even this last world would have had no permanence if God had executed his original plan of ruling it according to the principle of strict justice. It was only when he saw that justice by itself would undermine the world that he associated mercy with justice and made them to rule jointly. And thus from the beginning of all things prevailed divine goodness without which nothing could have continued to exist. All right, so that, you know, the story then goes into how the creation was established. And so even this particular story shows how the earth, when it became without form and void, that previous earth age and the previous world had been destroyed. And that what we see in Genesis chapter 1, verses 5 and onward, is the recreation, the reestablishment, and the reformation of the earth that it had originally been created to be inhabited and it had originally been created to be inhabited by God, not by Satan, not by the extraterrestrials, not by the fallen ones, but by the Holy Trinity, just as is revealed within all these scriptures that I'm reading from. All right, so let's continue. Isaiah chapter 37 verses 15. And this is uh, the Targum version, which is uh, maybe slightly different from the King James. It says this. And remember, follow along in the King James and you'll see how the, the Targum translation varies from what we have in our modern English translations. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord, saying, Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, whose Shechaniah dwelleth above the cherubim, thou art the Lord, and there is none besides thee in all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made the heavens and the earth. So again, it was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that created the heavens and the earth. As it says in Genesis chapter 2, verses 7, as well, that even though uh, in Genesis 1 it attributes the creation of the heavens and the earth to Elohim, uh, which still, in my opinion, Elohim is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, you know, the angels uh, uh, helped in some manner. But, again, it's only the Godhead that has the power to manifest from nothing and to imbue life. And even though the angels can assist, they do not have the power of instant manifestation like the Godhead does. All right. Continuing now. We're going into chapter 40. 
starting with verse 17. All, let me go to make sure I'm in the Targum translation. Okay, in the Targum. We'll start with verse 18. And whom do you think able to contend with God? And what is the likeness that ye can compare with him? Behold, the artificer maketh an image, and the goldsmith overlay it with gold, and with silver chains. The silversmith fastened it. He cuts a wild ash of the forest, which rottenness will seize. He procures a skilled artist to fix the image, that it be not moved. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Hath not the work in the creation been declared unto you in its order from the beginning? Have ye not understood that ye ought to fear him who hath created the foundations of the earth? Basically, Isaiah is telling you there in that passage, uh, you know, have ye not considered what God told us of how he established the creation? And so he's referencing Genesis, the story of how the creation was established by God is found in in Genesis. Verse 22. Who maketh the Shechaniah of his glory to dwell in exalted strength. And all the inhabitants of the earth are in his estimation as locusts. He that stretcheth out the heavens as a little thing and spreadeth them out as the tent of the glory of the house of the Shechaniah, who gives princes over to weakness, the judges of the earth he bringeth to naught. Although they multiply, although they increase, although their children become great in the earth, yet nevertheless he will send his wrath among them, and they shall be confounded, and his word shall scatter them as the whirlwind, the chaff. To whom then will ye liken me? And to whom will ye equal me, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold that ye may fear him who hath created these things, who bringeth forth the host of the heavens by number. He calleth them all by their name on account of the combination of forces and might of power. Not one is hindered in its orb. Why sayest thou, Jacob, and speakest, Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my cause is removed from my God? Hast thou not known? Yea, Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord who hath created the foundations of the earth, is not fatigued, neither is weary? There is no end to his wisdom. Who giveth wisdom to the righteous that long for the words of the law, and to those who have no strength, he multiplieth strength. And the wicked youth shall be fatigued and shall be weary. And the impious young men shall utterly fall. But they that hope for the salvation of the Lord shall be gathered together from the midst of their captivity and shall increase their strength. And their youth shall be renewed like the sprout that springeth up. They shall hasten upon the wings of eagles. And not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 17 through 31 in the Targum version. All right. Um, the final chapter that I want to go through is chapter 45. And I'm going to read both the King James and the 
um, the Targum version. For those that aren't following along, uh, since we have time, I'm going to emphasize both to show you where the differences are. Because this is a very important chapter. And it's one that speaks on and brings forth the concept of salvation through the Messiah, the word of the Lord. And this is excluded largely from the King James. Uh, for those that follow my work, you, you know that in the 40-week study of the Targum that we did, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, we read all the way through Genesis and the majority of Exodus. But having done the, as far as seeking how many times the word of the Lord is mentioned in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Torah, the Tanakh, the law, the books of Moses, you find that in the Targum, the word of the Lord is mentioned 217 times in just those five books. And when you look up in the King James Version, uh, in the first five books, how many times the word of the Lord is mentioned, you'll find that it is only 11 times. And so to have that many translations and allusions to the word of the Lord removed from the five books shows to me that it's not accidental that they purposely the scribes or the transliteralists or whoever that somebody had an agenda just as they remove the name of the Father and the Son from the Scriptures, in my opinion, in the same manner, removing the Word of the Lord that many times from the King James, in my mind, shows that they were trying to hide Christ's previous relationship with the patriarchs and the prophets of old and his connection to Israel okay. that when you read the Targum you see that it was the word of the Lord even that banished Adam from paradise and that had gone to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that he was their helper and they all believed upon him and knew that salvation came through him. And this knowledge was passed down in testament throughout their generations. And you can find confirmation of this in the two book set that I recently released called The Testament of the Patriarchs and the Prophets, which shows all of those extra biblical texts which verify and confirm that knowledge of Christ as Savior and Messiah was passed down from Adam all through his generations, Seth and Enoch, Noah, uh, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, and on and on and on, to David, uh, to Solomon, and onwards. That knowledge of his being Savior and Messiah was preserved within their testaments. And I compiled all of this also in one of my latest books called The Ancient Prophecies of Christ, which you can find. I took all of these specific allusions to his coming first and second advent and separated them from all of the other passages and made you know put, put them all together in compilation within that one book and reading it you, you know it's undeniable that uh, Israel that Adam and his sons 
that they worshipped a triune Godhead, which included the Holy Spirit as the feminine aspect of it. All right, continuing. Verse 5, we'll begin there. Chapter 45 of Isaiah. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now, this is very important because a lot of people, especially at agnostics and atheists, they allude to this passage and show that God creates evil. But that's not what it says in the Targum, that this has been misinterpreted. And in my opinion, it, um, for whatever reason, whoever translated this, they left the whole idea that God is responsible for evil when he is not. He is righteous and he um, gives free will to the angels and humanity and we create evil, perverting the good. And so let's look at the translation of this verse in the Targum and I think you're going to be mind blown. It says here, I am the Lord and none else. Also, I want to say that before I go into this, that in the first four verses, if you read this, he is speaking to Cyrus and he mentions Cyrus in name. And it was this, this passage in Isaiah written hundred years of years in advance of Cyrus even being born that was shown to him and convinced him that God was going to establish him as a ruler and that he would then uh, reestablish Israel and give them the money to rebuild the temple. And all that passed and, and was fulfilled prophetically, which, again, is another way that shows that, you know, God is the author of the scriptures and that they were divinely inspired. And, you know, um, I believe it was David that showed that to Cyrus and that understanding and seeing that uh, he knew what he had to do. Or maybe it was Ezra or Nehemiah. David, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Jeremiah, they were the ones. And Baruch, he was the scribe. They were the ones that were alive during the diaspora when Nebuchadnezzar took them exile. All right, so anyways, let's go back to this passage. I am the Lord and none else. There is no God beside me. I have supported thee, though thou hast not known that thou shouldst fear me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, I am the Lord and there is none else, who prepares the light and creates the darkness, makes peace and creates punishment for evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. And so you, do you see how much of a difference that makes when you read it in the Targum? God doesn't create evil. He creates punishment for evil, which absolutely makes sense when you consider that God is righteous. And so another one of the reasons why I recommend people study the Targum and read it in the Aramaic, the in the language that was first translated from the Hebrew Torah, because Targum just means translation. And the Aramaic is the translation of the Hebrew Torah uh, that preceded even the Greek Septuagint. 
And it's the first authorized translation. And it was the Hebrew people, the Jews, uh, and, you know, the Israelites that utilized the Aramaic Targum for study when they recreated the, um, the, the Holy Temple after the diaspora. When they began worship again, they, the, the rabbis, the priests, they kept having to stop worship to translate the text from t- Hebrew into Aramaic. And so they just authorized the, the Targum. And now we have the English translation of the Aramaic Targum available to us. It was translated in 1862. And uh, it's quite a fascinating text. One of my most favorite when it comes to the study of Scripture. All right, continuing. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation. And let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it? Here, again, it makes mention that God created humanity. And, you know, and even the pre-Adamites that were created upon the earth and to multiply upon the earth, which he makes mention of that uh, in in a little bit. But it says that God created them, not Satan, not the fallen ones. What makest thou or thy work? He hath no hands. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, what hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his Maker. Ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the works of my hands. Command ye me. I have made the earth, and created man upon it. See, now this is specific to the pre-Adamites, because they were the ones that were created on the earth. And told to multiply and replenish the earth. Adam was made, even though his uh, body was made from the dust of the ground. (coughs) The Holy Spirit was blown into him to give him life. And he was placed into paradise, the garden of God, above the vaulted dome. So continuing. So it says, ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city and he shall let go my captives. Not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. Thus saith the Lord, the labor of Egypt and merchandise of Ethiopia and of Sabians, men of stature shall come over unto thee, and they shall be thine, they shall come after thee. In chains they shall come over, and they shall fall down unto thee. They shall make supplication unto thee, saying, Surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God. Verily, thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. They shall be ashamed and also confounded. All of them they shall go to confusion. Together that are makers of idols. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded, world without end. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, 
God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. You know, if people would read the scriptures, they'd, there'd be no denying that God created the heavens and the earth and all of humanity, both the pre-Adamites and uh, modern humanity. Verse 19, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth, I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save them. I tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord and there is no God else beside me? A just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look upon unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself. The word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness. And shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. We know that that happens before Christ as the judge at the end of days, which will become clear in the Targum translation of these passages. Surely shall one say in the Lord, have I righteousness and strength? Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. All right, so now I'm going to read this from, yeah, I I was going to read chapter 30. I mean, um, 44, but I'm not going to have time. I'll just go directly into 45. Okay, follow along in the King James. And I'm going to start with the prophecies of Cyrus here. I should have time to read all of this. Thus saith the Lord who is anointed to Cyrus, whom I hold firm by his right hand to deliver the nations unto him. And I will loose the loins of the kings to open the doors before him and the gates shall not be shut. My word shall go before thee. I will have a way in the plains. If I will break in pieces the doors of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron, which that's a fulfillment of prophecy when Christ went down into Sheol. Because those are the doors of brass and the bars of iron he's talking about. All right, I'm going to skip just a little bit. Just to make sure I can get through this. All right, going to verse 7 again. Who prepares the light and creates darkness, makes peace and creates punishment for evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Let the heavens drop down from above and the clouds flow with good. Let the earth open itself and the dead live and let righteousness be revealed together. I, the Lord, have created them. Woe to him who thinks of striving against the words of his creator and trust that the images of a potter shall do him good, which are made out of the dust of the earth. Is it possible that the clay could say to him that worketh it, 
thou hast not made me? Or thy work he hath no hands? Woe to him that saith to his father, What begettest thou? And to his mother, What hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and he that formed him, Ye question me about things concerning my people, which shall come to pass, and will ye command me concerning the work of my power? It is I who have made the earth by my word, and I have created man upon it. It is I who have suspended the heavens by my power, and I have laid the foundation of all the hosts of them. It is I who will verily bring him forth publicly, and all his paths I will direct. He shall build my city, and he shall let the captives of my people go, not for a price nor for money, saith the Lord of hosts. Thus saith the Lord, the wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Ethiopia, and of the men of the Sabines, the men of traffic, shall come unto thee, and thine they shall be. They shall walk according to thy command. They shall pass along in chains. And they shall bow down unto thee, and shall supplicate thee, saying, Verily, God is in thee, and there is no God whatever besides him. Verily, thou art he who dost make thy Shechaniah to dwell in the highest heaven, God of Israel, the Savior. They shall be ashamed and confounded. All of them, the worshipers of images, shall walk in confusion. Israel shall be saved by the word of the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded forever. Yea, for ages after ages. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens. He who laid the foundation of the earth and made it is God. He formed it. He created it not in vain, but he formed it that the sons of man should multiply upon it. I am the Lord and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of the house of Jacob. Seek me reverently in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth, declaring upright things. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together ye that are escaped of the nations. They know nothing that carry about their wooden images and who pray unto a God who shall not save. Tell ye and draw ye near, yea, take counsel together, who hath declared this from ancient time, who hath told it from that time, have not I the Lord? And there is no God whatever besides me, a just God and a Savior, there is none but I. Turn unto my word, and be ye saved, all that are at the ends of the earth. For I am the Lord, and there is none else. I have sworn by my word, the word is gone forth in righteousness from my presence, and shall not fail. That before me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely he has promised to bring me righteousness and strength by the word of the Lord. In his word they shall offer praise. And all the nations that are incensed against his people shall be ashamed. In the word of the Lord all the seed of Israel shall be justified. And glorified. And so you see, um, especially in these last few verses, how 
uh, again, like for instance, in verse 24 and 25, it says, surely shall one say in the Lord, have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. That's the King James. But, you know, again, in the Targum, it says, Surely he has promised to bring me righteousness and strength by the word of the Lord, which we know to be Christ. So why take that out? Why change that? You know, they they say that the Jews were not believers or the Israelites were, were not believers in Christ. But when you read and study the original translations, they absolutely were. They knew their Savior Messiah. They wrote passages and scriptures and um, countless over and over and over the revelation of the word of the Lord was mentioned all throughout the scriptures. As I said, even when, when, um, when Adam was cast out of paradise, you see mentioned of the coming of Christ as Savior Messiah, that he would redeem them. Let me see if I can find just a passage that I can share with you which shows this. Okay, I think... uh, All right. For instance, here. This is from one of the primary atomic literature. It says, and this is from the ancient prophecies of Christ. God said to Adam, I have ordained on this earth days and years, and you and your descendants shall live and walk in them until the day and years are fulfilled when I shall send the word that created you and against which you have transgressed, the word that made you come out of the garden and that raised you when you were fallen. Yes, the word that will again save you when the five and a half days are fulfilled. But when Adam heard these words from God and of the great five and a half days, he did not understand the meaning of them. For Adam was thinking there would only be five and a half days for him until the end of the world. And Adam cried and prayed to God to explain it to him. Then God in his mercy for Adam who was made after his own image and likeness explained to him that these were and years and how one would then come and save him and his descendants. I'll share this from the testament of Adam. It shows just how knowledgeable All right, let me. uh, And how they knew of the coming of the Messiah, if if I can find it. Uh, I know what I can do. I'll do this. Let me seek this out. I should have just enough time to, to read this to you. If I can find it. There's so much. Uh, Okay, here's an example. All right, this is from the Testament of Jacob. It says, As we have found it written in the ancient books of our holy fathers who were pleasing unto God, through their supplication and their prayers, may all of us together be granted to share their lot in the kingdom of our Lord and of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, through whom is the glory of the Father with him and the holy life-giving Spirit, now and always and forever. Amen. Remember me that 
God may forgive me all my sins and give me understanding and give me stability without sin. Amen. In the Testament of Reuben, it says, Then shall all the earth rest from trouble and all the world under heaven from war. Then the mighty one of Israel shall glorify Shem. For the Lord God shall appear on earth and himself save men. Then shall all the spirits of deceit be given to be trodden underfoot, and men shall rule over wicked spirits. Then shall I arise in joy and will bless the Most High because of his marvelous works, because God hath taken a body and eaten with men and saved men. And now, my children, obey Levi and Judah, and be not lifted up against these two tribes, for from them shall arise unto you the salvation of God. For the Lord shall raise up from Levi, as it were, a high priest, and from Judah, as it were, a king, God and man. He shall save all the Gentiles and the race of Israel. Therefore I give you these commands that ye may also command your children, that they may observe them throughout their generations. And this is from the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. I'll read one more. This is from Levi. Now, therefore, observe whatsoever I command you, children, for whatsoever things I have heard from my fathers I have declared unto you. And behold, I am clear from your ungodliness and transgression, which you shall commit in the end of the ages against the Savior of the world, Christ acting godlessly. But the veil of the temple shall be rent so as not to cover your shame, and ye shall be scattered as captives among the Gentiles, and shall be for a reproach and for a curse there. For the house which the Lord shall choose shall be called Jerusalem, as it is contained in the book of Enoch the righteous. Um, another prophecy here. Who shall lay their hands upon the Savior of the world? There's so much that confirms you know, Christ as in the coming of Messiah. It says in the testimony of Judah, until the salvation of Israel shall come, until the appearing of the God of righteousness. And after these things shall a star to you from Jacob in peace, and a man shall arise from my seed like the son of righteousness, walking with the sons of men in meekness and righteousness, and no sin shall be found in him. And the heaven shall be opened unto him to pour out the Spirit, even the blessings of the Holy Father. All right, I'm going to have to leave it there. God bless all. Good night. Shalom.